What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part one of our story series for Baldur's Gate 1. So if you're unfamiliar with how I like to do my story series, because I honestly haven't done one in a while, plus I've gained a ton of new subscribers since then, what I like to do is walk people through the plot of the game story beat by story beat, so we'll kind of be playing the game at the same time. That said, not really going over a lot of side content. Truthfully, there's not that much in this particular game that's that amazing anyway. Most of it's pretty short quests. Not to say they're bad, just pointing that out. So we're just focused on the main story and the actual plot, which is fairly linear. There's some stuff here and there I'll call out that can kind of change depending on what you do. But for the most part, it's pretty linear and it all kind of resolves the same way regardless. Still the top the cliffs that rise from the Sword Coast. The Citadel of Candlekeep houses the finest and most comprehensive collection of writings on the face of Farron. It is an imposing fortress, kept in strict isolation from the intrigues that occasionally plague the rest of the Forgotten Realms. It is secluded, highly regimented, and it is home. Within these hallowed halls of knowledge, your story begins. You have spent most of your twenty years of life within this keep's austere walls under the tutelage of the sage Gorion. Acting as your father, he has raised you on a thousand tales of heroes and monsters, lovers and infidels, battles and tragedies. However, one story was always left untold, that of your true heritage. You have been told that you are an orphan, but your past is largely unknown. Lately, Gorion has been growing distant from you, as if some grave matter weighs heavily on his heart. You have asked about his concerns as gently as possible, but your queries have been in vain. Your sole comfort is the knowledge that he is a wise man, and you know he will tell you when the time is right. Nonetheless, his silence is troubling, and you cannot help but feel that something is terribly wrong. Today, Gorion has appeared more agitated than ever. And now he has uncharacteristically interrupted your chores in the middle of the day. Imparting hurried instructions for you to equip yourself for travel, he has handed you what gold he can spare, but given no clue as to why. Nevertheless, you now stand before the Candlekeep Inn, ready to purchase what you need for an unplanned and unexpected journey. So as we learned from the narration there, we are the ward of a man named Gorion who has been taking care of us. We don't know who our parents are, and we were raised in a place called Candlekeep. But recently, Gorion has expressed that we need to leave, and he gives you some money, takes you to the Candlekeep Inn, tells you to get geared up, and meet him outside the library so you guys can leave. So that's where the game actually starts, and you need to do just that. You need to ideally buy yourself some gear at the inn. In addition to those things, there are a couple of quests around Candlekeep that you can do. This is kind of your chance to get acquainted with the game. And if you go into two specific buildings inside Candlekeep, you will be attacked by an assassin who is there to kill you. What we don't know is why anyone would want to do this, but they are very clearly after you, which would obviously lend some immediacy to Gorion's request that you guys need to leave. Now, right before you get to Gorion, you will be stopped by a woman named Imowen, who seems to be your childhood friend, basically. Now, she will express that she's aware that you guys are leaving, and she wants to come with you, but is aware she won't be allowed to, so she just kind of lets it go. And then whenever you're ready, you can talk to Gorion. Now, he won't really tell you what's going on, or why specifically you guys need to leave, but it's pretty obvious the assassins have something to do with it. Now, as you guys are leaving, the little scripted event in-game here, Gorion will tell you that if you guys ever get separated, you need to head to the Friendly Arm Inn to meet his friends, Jahira and Khalid, who can help you. Now, almost immediately after this, you guys get ambushed, and Gorion gets attacked and killed while sending you away. So you guys get attacked by people who are clearly there for you, they state as much, and this is also the same armored man that we saw in the intro cinematic, which is something we the player would know. Now, to Gorion's credit, he does kill most of them, but is ultimately killed himself. Then we get this short narration here. Dawn is especially cruel this morning. You awake with the realization that you have not been living some horrible dream. Ambushed, you saw Gorion cut down before your eyes, and even his powerful magic could not stop the onslaught. It was his wish that you flee. But that does not remove the feeling of helplessness that now overwhelms you. Hand over your ward, the armored fiend had said. 
He was after you and you alone. But why? If only Gorion had given some clue. But now you are alone and lost. Candlekeep is near, but you will find no quarter there. The readers pay for their serenity with rather draconian entry rules, and without Gorion's influence, their doors will remain closed. You will not last long on your own with your meager equipment. Perhaps you can get some help from the friends Gorion mentioned, the ones at the Friendly Arm. Now, once that happens and we come to, we will be met on the road by Emmeline, who basically expressed her desire to escape Candlekeep on her own terms and then come with you. It is actually possible to avoid taking anyone into your party, because even if you tell Emmeline to leave here, she still joins your party, but if you don't want her in your party, just leave before she has a chance to talk to you, and that'll sort that out. She does tell you that she saw what happened to Gorion, and she feels terrible about it. She mentions that he might have a letter on his body kind of explaining why you guys had to leave, which is true. You can go grab that letter to an extent. It kind of explains a little more, but it's still super vague, and is signed by a man named E, or just E, I guess. But the letter just kind of explains that the powers that be have decided to let something just play out and be what it is, and he decided to at least warn Gorion beforehand. Now, all super vague explains basically nothing. Now, also on this map, we can run into Zar and Monteran, who are two adventurers headed to Nashkel to investigate some troubles there. They will express a desire to join your party, if you would like, to help them get to Nashkel, where they can then talk to the mayor there, Baron Gastkill, to kind of look into that. Now, you can head to the Friendly Arm first, which is what I suggest you do, but upon exiting to the next map, you will be stopped by an old man in red robes, who will basically point you in the direction of Friendly Arm in and kind of express just kind of general oddity, but not much to be garnered from that conversation right this second. And then you can head up to the Friendly Arm Inn, which is the map north of this one. The inn here seems to be actually sort of a castle that was converted into an inn, but upon trying to enter the actual inn itself, you will be stopped by a man named Tarnesh, who is very curious about who you are and where you've come from. And regardless of how you answer, even if you're not straightforward about who you actually are, Tarnesh turns out to be another assassin sent to kill you. Making it very clear, if it wasn't clear up to this point, that whatever is going on, these people are definitely after you for whatever reason, though you have no information about that. Now once you get inside the inn, we can find Khalid and Jahira in the upper left corner of the room here. And when we talk to them, they will express, of course, knowing who you are and knowing who Garion was. And while they are terribly sorry for his loss, they were instructed to help you if they could. Now, they understand that you're an adult these days, so ultimately that choice is up to you. But should you take them on as companions, they'll try their best to help you out. Now, Khalid and Jahira would also like to go to Nashkel because they are sort of mercenaries in a way. They describe themselves as people who look into local troubles. So they need to go to Nashkel to investigate the iron shortage. Now, chances are we've heard about this beforehand already because when you enter the inn, you will actually be stopped and spoken to about someone complaining about the iron shortage. And that basically there seems to be some problems in the Nashkel mines, which is what Jahira and Khalid would like to go investigate. And seeing as you have nothing else to do because your pseudo-father was killed in front of you just a short few days ago and you have nothing else going on in life, that's pretty much where the game picks up. Our next step is to go to Nashkel then. Nashkel is far to the south of the map, as you should be able to see here. But in order to get there, you usually have to stop by Baragost, which is the town in between here and Nashkel. Now, this is typically where you would do a bunch of side quests and stuff. There's a lot going on in and around Baragost, for instance. However, again, this is the story series, so we're just going to skip past all of that and head straight to Nashkel by heading south through the maps. Now, once we actually arrive in Nashkel, that is actually the end of the first chapter. So the first chapter is getting out of Candlekeep, meeting Khalid and Jahira at the inn, and then heading to Nashkel. Now, I do want to take this moment to mention that much of this game is actually skippable as terms of like objectives. So if you don't want to meet Khalid and Jahira, you can just head straight to Nashkel and that will still end chapter one. Now, if you choose to go into the inn in Nashkel, you will be attacked by yet another assassin. But our main goal here is to talk to the mayor, which is just south down the road a little bit. His name is Baron Gaskill again. He will recognize Jahira if they are with you, her and Khalid, and he will express what is happening with the mines. Basically, all the miners keep going missing or are being killed, and then the ore that they do get out of the mine is tainted somehow and basically unusable. 
and he will point you to the mines, which is just a little farther south of Nashkel proper. Now, once we get to the mines, we actually need to talk to the owner of the mines, who is just south of the entrance, before we can actually get into the mines. He'll give you a day to sort out the problems, but honestly, you can take as long as you want. And then after speaking to him, the guards will step out of the way once you talk to them and you can enter the mines. Now, the mines themselves are your first, like, big dungeon. It's a five-level dungeon. And on the first level, we'll run into a bunch of miners who kind of express what they think might be going on in the mines. They'll give you a lot of theories ranging from everything to there's a dragon down there to, you know, just more mysterious stuff. But the quickest way through the mines, typically speaking, is to follow the little rail cart tracks. They will typically lead you to the next level of the mine. And on the second level, upon entering it, will be stopped by a miner who is complaining about the yipping demons and how they're after him. And this is where things start to make a little more sense because immediately after this conversation, that man is killed by kobolds who then attack you. We have at least part of our answer right there. There's clearly kobolds causing some trouble. Now on this same level, once we get to the end of this uh, level, if you will, like right before you enter the third level, the kobolds we kill right in front of the third level entrance will have vials of mysterious liquid on them. Now, if we right-click that, it will explain that this is likely the residue that is being used to taint the ore. However, it's unlikely kobolds would be able to have done this by themselves. So, with that information, and by the way, if you happen to choose to drink this, it's just poison, so have fun with that. Once we enter the third level, there's not much going on here. We really just need to find the fourth level. And the fourth level is mostly empty. It is going to be housing this big, like, rock structure in the middle of a lake here which is where we actually need to go once we make our way over there. In here, we'll find a few things. First of all, there's kobolds that are going to attack us some more. In the uh, little upper northern room, we can find a man named Zan who is being held prisoner. He is one of the potential companions you can have. And then in the smaller room just south of that, we have Malahi. Now, when you talk to him, when you first walk up to him, he'll express the impression that you were sent by a man named Tazok to execute him. Now, you'll have two dialogue options to either be like, yep, that's totally what we're here for, or be like, that's not what we're here for at all, but you're still going to pay for your crimes type thing. Now, if you admit that you're not sent by Tazok, you'll fight more enemies, whereas if you lie to him, you'll fight less enemies, which is what that dialogue will actually lead to. If you tell him you are sent by Tazok, he'll tell you to look in the chest for letters that should prove he was doing his job. However, once you click into the chest, he'll then attack you with a smaller amount of enemies. Now, once we kill him, he'll drop a bunch of letters. So, these letters actually explain what was going on, but moreover, it's very clear Malahi was in charge of all the kobolds and they, they were listening to him. And once we pick up the letters, that's technically the end of chapter two. Hey, we'll relieve the fears of the terrorized folk of Nashkel. But you remain uneasy. While the half-orc may indeed have caused the evils that befell the mine, the shortage of iron is too widespread to be his doing alone. His letters confirm your suspicions, and though they give little indication as to where his cohorts are hiding, they may have links to the bandits that currently plague the coast way. But actually reading these letters, we will discover that Malahi was actually working for someone else, a man named Tazok, who sent him down here with the kobolds and the poison for the ore to render these mines unusable, while Tazok and his mercenaries, the Black Talon and the Chill, raided caravans and things, which is what we could have learned about the iron shortage, about how bandits were rounding up all the ore in the area. And these letters confirm that, that Tazok is leading bandits and mercenaries to do this with, that he's actively, in addition to rendering one of the mines useless, is also attacking caravans and things that might have iron, causing the iron shortage that we've heard about. Now, we also learn a couple other things from this. Uh, Malahi was not supposed to let the kobolds kill people, which then caused all the interest, which is why you're here now, which is what Tazok did not want. But moreover, that... Tazok had a sort of point of contact in the Feld post in, in Baragost, which is our next lead. Just a couple quick things real quick before we leave the mine. In Malahi's chest, there is actually the web spell, which is a guaranteed place to get it every time, which is very high value on later difficulties. Moreover, Malahi will also drop a holy symbol. If you pick that up and take it back to Baron Gaskill, he will give you a reward for clearing out the Nashkel mines. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that after you clear out the mines, if you choose to rest, you will be presented with a dream. You do not dream often, but tonight the visions are vivid indeed. Long have you walked, but now you find yourself back amidst the stones of Candlekeep. Your former home looms before you, 
but the gate is closed and barred. Over the walls there is a candle in your old room, but as the light goes out, the brick surrounding the window closes together. The very walls conspire to keep you at bay. A familiar voice startles you. Though it is calm and caring, you cannot go back this way, child. You must go on. Gorion forms before you, and though his image should be comforting, it seems but a shade of his living self. He is dead in your dreams, as in life. The phantom of your foster father gestures toward the blackness of the wood, as though it should be inviting. Perhaps it is, in a way, but the traveling will be hard. As you think this, a smooth and obvious path becomes clear out of the corner of your eye. It seems meant for you, pulls at your very being, and promises to quickly lead you away from the life you once led. Perhaps this would be for the best, but it is a bit too convenient for your liking. You do not wish to dwell upon the loss you have endured, but neither should it be forgotten. Gorion smiles and fades away. The pull becomes a push, but you turn away. Steadfast in your new direction, the way is not quite as clear, but it is sure to be interesting nonetheless. A whisper follows as you stride away, something vestigial and sinister that you recognize, but yet have never heard. You will learn. You don't look back. That is given to you in the form of some narration here. Now, in addition to just kind of being cool and giving you some more background kind of about your character throughout the game, these dreams, which we will have more of, actually give our characters special abilities. The first one gives your character the Cure Light Wound special ability, and it gives it to you as a special ability, not a spell. But that is going to do it for part one, and in our next part we will meet up with Transig, Tazok's point of contact at the Feld Post Inn in Baragost. So there you go guys, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you part two of our story of Baldur's Gate. So in part one, we successfully cleared the Nashkel mines, found out it was being caused by a man and his kobolds poisoning the iron there, and in a letter on his person, we found information that would lead us to the bandit camp he was working for, or mercenary camp might be a more accurate term, but nonetheless, we were left with one lead, and that was to find Transig at the Feld Post Inn in Baragost. Now, while that is certainly the most obvious lead, this can be done in two ways. In order to find the bandit camp, we can, of course, go talk to Transig, who will then, after interrogation, reveal the location of the bandit camp, and we can choose to let him live or not, and this will reveal the bandit camp on our map, allowing us to travel there, because until this, it's simply not on our map. Now, there is another option, actually. If we go to the areas of Peldvale or Larswood, which are mostly east of the Friendly Arm Inn in terms of where the maps are, it's possible to run into NPCs there that will actually let you be recruited into the bandit organization, if you will. Now, ultimately, both of these mostly play out the same way. The difference is if you go the recruitment option, not everyone in the camp is immediately hostile upon your arrival. However, you do still have to make your way to the largest tent in the bandit camp, which would be presumably where their leader is, and then there will be a fight there afterwards. The difference largely between these two options is that if you choose the recruitment option, in addition to actually, you know, not being hostile with all of them, you'll have the opportunity to meet Tazok, the leader of the bandit or mercenary group of the Black Talons and the Chill. Now, while you can't actually kill Tazok, you can fight him as like a recruitment thing, and once he gets low enough on health, he'll walk away from the fight and you're not able to kill him. However, it is possible to pickpocket him for some great items, which is why I mentioned this. Regardless of this, whether you chose to slaughter your way through the camp after interrogating Transig or you went the recruitment option, eventually you'll find your way into the large bandit camp tent, which is Tazok's tent, and then there will be a fight with the enemies in there. Now, if you went the recruitment option, the fight in here does not necessarily make the camp outside hostile to you. But once this fight is over, we will be left in an empty tent with one other person, Ender Sai, and a 
chest right behind him. Now, if you take the time to talk to Endersai, he will reveal that he was actually a prisoner. He was apparently a thief of sorts and explains that he was caught after messing with the organization, the Iron Throne. He'll go on to explain that while the mercenaries here of the Black Talon and the Chill, when they are caught, and moreover their leader, seems to encourage the idea that these people are working under the banner of a group called the Zentarum, or Zentarum, whatever it is. Now, according to Ender Sai, this is very demonstrably not true, because he knows what he's doing, and he's never messed with that group. However, the second he started stealing from the Iron Throne, he was caught and imprisoned here at this camp. It is very clear that they are, nonetheless, intentionally disrupting the iron supply by raiding caravans and things like that that have iron. And moreover, when they're caught, they are then shifting blame to another group. Now, right behind Endersai is a chest. This is actually trapped. If you open this before talking to Endersai, the trap will kill him if you don't disarm it. Now, the letters in the chest that we can find actually tell us quite a few things. They confirm that these people are responsible for the assassins that have been trying to kill us. However, it does not offer an explanation as to why this is. Moreover, these letters further mention that the boss of Tazok, one Deveorn, I honestly have no idea how to pronounce this dude's name, so I'm probably just going to call him Dave. Nonetheless, they're leading another operation out of the Cloakwood, which is of course going to be our next destination after this. Now, these letters also mention a person named Saravok and how he won't be happy if Tazok fails in his mission to have you and your friends killed. Now, after this, we're pretty much done with the bandit camp. After we exit the tent, at any point, once we rest, we can have another dream. It is worth mentioning, I actually didn't mention this in part one, that these dreams can actually change slightly depending on your reputation. And if you have a reputation below, I believe it's nine, it will actually give you a different ability. Whereas if you have a high reputation, it gives you a support ability. A low reputation will typically give you a damaging ability. But it does change a little bit depending on it. But here's the dream. Night is warm and calm. It is though someone has walked across your grave, and for a moment, you wonder if it was you. With this thought, the ground beneath you opens, and you are swept into the dark. When light returns, you do not find its presence comforting. Before you lay the empty mines of Nashkel, cleansed by your previous passage, you move through walls and floors alike, descending deeper and deeper, until a bloated figure comes into view. Mullahe, in no better shape than you left him, stands motionless before you. Held from whatever afterlife calls it, this foul apparition has been waiting for you. A dagger of bone hovers before it, ready for a willing hand to drive it deep. Had this creature breath, you were sure it would be hurling curses. It waits for the kill, a death beyond death and knows no hope. You turn your back on the blade, and it clatters to the floor. Punishment enough shall find this creature in the land of the dead. You need not inflict any more upon him. Surprised and thankful, the visage of Mullahe hobbles forward and through you, off to whatever fate it deserves. Perhaps for safekeeping, it leaves a part of itself behind. It is a spark of hope that fills a space within you. A dagger-shaped hole you did not know was empty. There is a cry of rage from the depths, and the dagger of bone launches itself through the air, your heart its target. You awake just as it should have struck, and the cold sweat that covers you stings your eyes. A disapproving voice lingers in your ears, though it should have disappeared with the dream. You will learn. Now, after this, we'll know that we need to head to the Cloakwood. The Cloakwood, before this, was actually completely inaccessible. Your character can't find it, much like they can't find the bandit camp. However, the easiest way to get there is from the Friendly Arm Inn. There's a good chance that when you do this, you'll run into the old man from Part 1 again that showed up almost immediately after Gorion was killed. Now, I will mention this is like a little weird because you'll suddenly know his name despite the fact that I'm pretty sure he never actually told it to you. But it shows his name is Elminster, which is important because that starts with an E, and the letter on Gorion's body was signed E. But if you talk to this old man and don't tell him to get lost, he will explain that you obviously need to go to the Cloakwood. Now, the Cloakwood itself has to be navigated map by map, which is unlike the rest of the world map, 
which typically allows you to exit the map from a uh, like north, south, east, or west, or whatever and then go to the next map over that way. The Cloakwood, regardless of where you exit those maps at, it will only ever unlock the next area of the Cloakwood. You actually have to go through them in order. And eventually, you'll find your way to a mine there. Now, while you're in the Cloakwood, you can have another dream, as this is technically the next chapter. Once you killed the, once you picked up the letters in the bandit camp, that actually ended chapter three and began chapter four. So in chapter four, we can have yet another dream. Here's that. As darkness falls, your mind drifts back to events past, and to triumphs well-deserved indeed. A fortified camp secluded and guarded from the entire coast, and it is not but easy pickings before your guile. All manner of bandit and brigand move about here, but you may as well be invisible amongst them. Your recollections are interrupted by a powerful gust of wind, lifting you high above the camp and woods both. Your ark crests in the high morning sun, and for a moment you are as a bird, free from your duties to those below. With unseen hands, the earth reasserts her hold on you, and suddenly you feel less like a sparrow and more like a catapult stone. Without impact or fanfare, the ground accepts your passage and does not strike back. In a moment, all is black, and for all you know, you have descended to the very core of the world. The rock around you illuminates, and a cavern slowly takes shape. Though you can see no more than a few steps ahead or behind, stumbling forward, you find yourself face to face with yourself. Before you is a likeness in stone exact to the smallest detail. A voice in the darkness accuses you, even as it seems amused. Such pride undeserved, great predator, when your whole being is borrowed, Credit where it is due, and dues where payment is demanded. A dagger of bone flies from the blackness and strikes the statue square. It cracks slightly, but the pain you feel is as though you were rent asunder. You were made as you are, taunts the voice, and you can also be broken. You fall backward into the void, and do not come to rest until morning wakes you. And beyond that, once we get into the Cloakwood, there's a lot of side quests around here. There's an especially infamous one involving a bunch of spiders. But you'll have to go through these areas, so if you want to do these side quests at the same time, it's a good time, but they're not related to the main story, so it's not really what we're going to cover here. But eventually, you will make your way to a mine. Now, directly outside the mine, once you actually kind of enter the little enclosure that the mine is put in, you will run into a band of mercenaries that were hired specifically to kill you. They were hired to guard this mine from you, and you will have to fight them. And once that fight's over, you can eventually make your way into the mine proper. Now, on the first floor, the most notable thing is the slaves outside of a water plug. Because, for starters, every person working in this mine is either working for the Iron Throne, or they are a slave being forced to work the mines. That is an important note, we'll circle back to it later. But on the first floor, we can find slaves outside of a water plug. This is a plug that keeps water from the surrounding lake from flooding the mine. There is a key to this plug. However, the slaves would like you to free the other slaves so they can leave prior to you flooding the mine. Now, reasons you would want to flood the mine are to make this mine useless to the Iron Throne. But again, we'll talk more about that later. I'm just mentioning that this is where this is, and it would allow you to disable the mine from these people who are clearly trying to kill you. Now, the second floor seems to act as a bit of a barracks for the mercenary group, as well as the prison for slaves that are put in like isolation or whatever. That prison is where you can find Rill. Rill is the leader of the slaves, and giving him a hundred gold and sending him on his way allows him to bribe one of the guards, while you're distracting everyone else, to get the slaves out of the mine. If you want to save the slaves, that is how you do it. After that, you can move on to the third floor, which just has lots of enemies and lots of stuff going on, and eventually you'll make your way to the fourth floor, which is where you'll find Dave. So, this guy is a bit of a boss fight. I would tell you when you walk up to him, it's important to disarm the traps on the path to him, because two of them will spawn battle horrors, which are incredibly annoying. But beyond that, fight him. It's usually a kind of a waiting game for him to run out of his spells, because he has a lot of defensive spells that he'll cast constantly but eventually he'll run out of spell slots and be forced to fight you. And once we kill him, we can find several letters on his body that do a lot of explaining. First of all, these letters are from a man named Realtar, 
He once again references the other person we heard of in the letters at the Bandon camp, Saravok. Realtar is telling Dave here that Saravok will be taking over all of the mercenary groups and that Tazok works for Saravok. Moreover, Realtar explains that they have set up a base for the Iron Throne in the city of Baldur's Gate. These letters also explain that the Iron Throne has infiltrated the Seven Sons Merchant Group. Now, I want to take this time to explain something that is easy to miss here which can cause some confusion. These letters also explain this mine is not known to be in operation, meaning that it is not known to the city of Baldur's Gate that this mine is producing iron ore. These letters go on to explain actually that Transig, the man we met and possibly killed earlier, was sent to the Cloakwood regularly with several bags of holding to pick up the ore as one person and then transport it, theoretically, to wherever the Iron Throne is holding it. So they are stockpiling, secretly, iron ore. So to bring that full circle, this explains to us that the Iron Throne is behind sabotaging the Nashkel mine, hiring mercenaries and bandit groups to disrupt trade routes and things to create even more of an iron shortage by disrupting imports, all while secretly stockpiling iron themselves. So what we know at this point is 100% that they have artificially created this iron shortage while simultaneously hoarding iron. We also know that they've set up shop in Baldur's Gate, the actual city. And, don't forget, we know that they've recently set up an agent with the Seven Sons Merchant Group. So, from here, towards the back of Dave's room, we can find his apprentice, which will tell us basically all the same information we just learned from all these letters. Moreover, there is actually a lift in this back room that we can take back up to the first floor of the mine, because Dave will have had a key on him, that is the key to plugging or flooding the mines. Now, to be very clear, you don't have to do this part. In fact, it doesn't really seem to have any consequences that I could tell, but if you want to, you can flood the mines. Moreover, you can make the decision to not free the slaves and then lie to the slave guarding the plug about freeing the slaves and kill all the slaves and everyone else left in the mine by flooding them and drowning them all. Or you can have given Rill the 100 gold he asked for earlier which will then have escorted all the slaves out of the mine, then flood it, making the mine non-operational, thus hurting the Iron Throne, as well as saving the slaves. But to be clear, the chapter ends when Dave dies. You do not have to do this flood the mines part. In fact, again, not doing it doesn't seem to have any effect at all, really. You have dealt a great blow to the organization known as the Iron Throne, a defeat that you are certain will not be ignored. Now you must travel to the great city of Baldur's Gate, where you are certain to find the truth behind the strange plot that plagues the citizens of the Sword Coast. And that is where we are going to leave part two. So in this part, we discovered basically the entirety of the plot by the Iron Throne. And now we need to head to the city of Baldur's Gate, which previously up to this point has been closed to us. And then we can investigate more of what's going on with this artificial iron shortage that's being caused. So with that out of the way, I certainly hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. We are growing absolutely tremendously. Cannot thank you guys enough. The show of support for everything that I've been doing has just been honestly just mind blowing. So thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part three of our Story of Baldur's Gate series. Now, this being part three, we are just going to jump right into it. So in our last episode, we basically discovered that there was quite the conspiracy involving the Iron Throne operating out of Baldur's Gate to artificially create an iron shortage, and that at least one of those two leaders, Saravok, has been actively trying to kill us. Moreover, that the other member, Realtar, as well as Saravok, should be able to be tracked down in the city of Baldur's Gate, which is where we are headed next. Before we actually jump into that content, I do want to mention a couple of things. The last three chapters of this game, which is what we have left to talk about as far as the main main story goes, we will be covering Siege of Dragonspear at the end as well, by the way. But the last three chapters of the main game here are very easily skipped through if you know what you're doing. And because of that, a lot of interactions can like not come up at all. 
some NPCs can be killed and thus change things quite a bit. There is one in particular that I don't think actually can be killed because I've attacked him and it won't let you kill him, which is how I know. But some important NPCs that you might think are integral can still die. Because at the end of the day, for chapter 5, which is what we're in now, if you know what you're doing, this chapter can be completed in like 5 minutes. Because all you technically have to do is go to a building in Baldur's Gate, find a letter, take it to someone, and then ta-da, the chapter's over. But obviously, this being the story of series, we're going to cover it quite a bit more than that. So first things first, we need to head to the bridge that actually leads to Baldur's Gate. Now, up to this point in the game, this bridge was closed. The drawbridge for the main part of the bridge was pulled up, if you will, so you couldn't get past. Now, as we're crossing the bridge, we will eventually be stopped by a flaming fist mercenary, who are sort of the police, in a way, of the city and they will basically charge you a fee for entry, and then the leader of the Flaming Fist will come out to meet you, a man named Scar. Now, technically, Scar is the leader of, like, the forces. However, he still answers to one of the Grand Dukes. The Grand Dukes rule the city of Baldur's Gate. Scar will just flat out ask you if you are the mercenary group that has been hounding the mines in the area. Now, you can just outright lie to Scar at every turn. The game still tries to force you into the path of talking to him, but you can also choose to inform Scar about the Iron Throne. He'll be like, well, that's interesting information, but I can't do anything about that just yet. And then he'll ask you to do a few jobs for him. Specifically, the first thing he'll ask you to do is investigate the Seven Sons Merchant Group. This is one of the leads we actually got from the mine previously, if you recall. We were told that the Iron Throne had planted agents within the Seven Suns Trading Coster, I believe it's actually called. That seems like a pretty good place to start, since it's literally one of the leads we were given. So that's what we're going to do. Now, the second we walk into the actual city, we will be stopped by Elminster again. He'll ask us some questions about how we feel about Gorion, that kind of thing. But moreover, he also goes on to mention that we can trust Scar and Eltan above anyone else in the city. Everyone else, you might want to question their motives, but according to him, Scar and Eltan can be trusted. Once you're in the city proper, there's a ton of quests and stuff to do. This is typically where you'd do a bunch more side questing, like in the actual city, which will sometimes send you back out of the city. There's a lot of cool side quests in town. We're not really going over those. I just want to mention that this would be a thing you would do because the city itself is actually like nine or ten maps connected to each other. And it's a lot of fun to explore. But again, none of this you have to do by any means for this chapter. But while you're exploring and doing all those things, chances are you're going to rest. And when you rest, you are likely to have another one of your strange dreams. So here is that. Tonight you dream of blood. Not of blood on a blade or the blood on your hands, but an ichor that runs as a torrent through the realms. A flood that pours across the fields and forests. An ocean that floats you to the world's edge and threatens to cascade off into the void. This blood seems a frightening thing, a massive force that sweeps away all resistance. As a whole, it is a monster, and it cannot be stopped. Were it to be viewed from on high, it would seem to cover the entire world in its red-black embrace. You, however, do not have such a lofty perch. From within the deluge, you can see it does not move as one, but is filled with currents eddies, and undertoes. Pockets of calm afford breathing space, whilst violent whirlpools threaten to rend limb from limb. Ultimately, it seems undirected and lacks a driving will, a quality you have in abundance. You may be caught within, but sufficient determination can shape what you need to survive. There are still options open, still choices to be made. As the tide presses forward, you steer as you wish, atop a ship called Persistence and under sails made of resolve. A sudden and deliberate wave puts an end to your course and to the dream. It would seem that the Flood does have some will and took offense to your enjoying the ride. Now we're going to cover the Seven Sons because that's what Scar asked us to do, and that's pretty much all we're given directly in terms of the narrative to follow up on. The Seven Sons is in the western part of the city, actually on the exact same map as the Flaming Fist headquarters. And when you enter this part of the map, chances are the Seven Sons building is the first building you'll see. So it's pretty easy to find. As you start talking to merchants, they will tell you that people's faces have been shifting that he's seen, like the person who accosts you as you walk in the door, which is important because one of the reasons Scar actually asks us to investigate is because Scar is friends with a man named Josso, who is actually the leader of the Seven Sons group. And apparently, according to Scar, Josso has been acting incredibly strangely. So to then come in here, 
hear this merchant tell us that people's faces and things are changing, it's very suspicious. Now, the absolute quickest way to resolve the Seven Sun thing is as soon as you walk into the building and talk to this guy, literally just go left. There's actually a stairs that lead down to the basement where you will be immediately be attacked by a doppelganger and then rescue Josso, who is being held prisoner here. Now, Josso will explain that some time ago, probably several months, his people started being replaced by doppelgangers until he himself was kidnapped and replaced. Keep in mind, we know that the Iron Throne is behind this, but we don't know is why they would do this. So if we choose to do this, we can kill everyone else because every merchant in this building is actually a doppelganger and then head back to Scar. If we head back to Scar first, which is actually what the game tells you to do, he'll then send you back and tell you to kill everyone anyway. Truthfully, it makes no difference. But once you talk to Scar, he'll actually give you a second follow-up mission that he'd like you to investigate some missing people. This actually has nothing to do with the Iron Throne at all, so very quickly. People are missing, he'll send you to the eastern part of the city. You go to the sewers in the eastern part of the city. There's an ogre mage kidnapping and killing people and stealing their jewelry and stuff. If you take some of that stuff back, give it to Scar, he'll give you an extra reward. And then at this point, he'll explain that someone wants to meet you, which is none other than Duke Elton. He'll take you to meet Duke Elton, and Elton himself will ask you to investigate the Iron Throne. And then he will send you to the Iron Throne Tower. Now, this is the building that I mentioned. If you know where it's at, you can skip basically all of Chapter 5. It's actually not difficult to find. It's just in the port area. You simply would need to know what you need to do here, which is what makes this chapter so easily skipped through. But once we arrive at the Iron Throne headquarters, this is actually pretty straightforward. All we need to do is climb the levels of the tower. We'll usually be stopped by an NPC or so on each level that will ask us various questions, etc. But we can also learn a few key things. Talking to an emissary Tar, who is actually a representative of the Grand Duke's council, if you will, we can learn that the Seven Sons, as well as the Merchants League in town, have actually forfeited their minds over to the Iron Throne. Which, right there, I mentioned because that explains why the Iron Throne was replacing their agents with doppelgangers. It's so they could take control of those groups and their iron as well. Moreover, we learn that the Dukes are making a deal with the Iron Throne to supply them with iron and weapons. Because they don't have anywhere else to turn at this point. Now, once we get to the very top floor, we will be stopped by agents working specifically for Saravok. And they will attempt to kill you no matter what you say or do. This fight can be a little tough, by the way. But once you clear it out... You'll find one letter on their bodies, which is from Saravok himself, telling them that they need to look out for and stop you specifically. However, that's not the evidence we need to bring back to Eltan. We go into a room just south of this, and we investigate a desk, we can find two more letters. These letters are important because they explain that Realtar isn't in town. He's headed for Candlekeep to have a bit of a business meeting there with an unnamed associate. Moreover, we find another letter explaining to... Realtar that Saravok won't be in attendance at this meeting because he has to go personally oversee Tazok and his mercenaries apparently. The important thing about this letter is that we learn that Saravok is apparently Realtar's son, as Saravok addresses this letter to his father, Realtar. These letters are what we need to bring back to Eltan. Once we do, Eltan will basically explain that while this is definitely damning information, ultimately without hard proof and the situation with Om which is a neighboring city that they are almost at war with over this iron shortage, he can't really take any action without hard evidence, which we don't have. We have a bunch of letters. Elton will give you a rare book and then send you on your way to Candlekeep. The game travels you there. The book is important because it's the only way to get back into Candlekeep. If you've asked yourself throughout the story, why couldn't you just go back to Candlekeep? It's because Candlekeep has a very strict entry policy where basically in order to enter, regardless of when you leave or whatever, you have to donate some knowledge to the keep, which this book that Elton gives you is the only thing in game that's going to let you do that. But once we give the warden at the gate the book, we can then re-enter Candlekeep. Now, Candlekeep is pretty cool and there's a lot going on that can be completed in a variety of ways. Basically, you'll talk to a ton of people and they will all tell you that everyone around here is acting real weird all of a sudden and not like themselves which is relevant considering we just killed a whole bunch of people who were replaced by doppelgangers. But moreover, they'll all specifically mention one person, someone named Kovaros, and basically say that of everyone, he's acting especially strangely. But we'll circle back to that in just a second, because the other big thing we can learn here is actually huge in terms of plot relevance, but there are two people in Candlekeep that we can talk to that will tell us about Gorion's possessions that he left here, 
that you can have as you were his basically son. So you can learn this on, I believe it's the fifth floor of the keep or potentially the sixth floor if you talk to someone else. Both of these people will give you a key to Garion's old lodgings, if you will, where you can then go to his room and open a chest there. This chest will contain a letter, and when you open it, it has some incredibly revealing things for your character. And that most specifically, that while he is not your biological father, of course, he does know who was, and that is none other than the god Ball. Lord of Murder. This letter goes on to explain that basically during the time of troubles, as it's called, when gods walked the earth, Baal foresaw his death, made a bunch of children, was killed, and Garion was actually friends with your mother, which is how he managed to find you. Unfortunately, she died as well, and Garion took you in, and you guys basically lived at Candlekeep there since. You are, factually, Ballspawn the child of this god. However, there are many people that would use this power to abuse you for their own ends. And he specifically names Saravok in this letter, because apparently, in his past, Saravok actually came to study at Candlekeep, which one would presume is where he learned about you to begin with. These are all events prior to the game. Huge revelations there, but let's get back to continuing the story. You close your eyes tonight, and visions of Candlekeep swim into view. As you pass through the gates of the citadel, there is a flash of memory, and you are a child of only a few seasons once more. At your side is Gorion, gray-haired even all those years ago. How old must he have been to age so little in the time since? Aged as he ever was, you still have to run to keep up with him. He has an important meeting with Ulrant, the keeper of the tomes. An important meeting about you. Funny, you don't remember it. As you stand outside the doors of the inner keep, you can hear the shouting from within. Gorion seldom raised his voice, though you did not care to listen to the discussions at your previous stops either. As you trace patterns in the water of a fountain, a reflection distracts you from the argument. A large raven has perched atop a stone wall and stares directly at you with huge black eyes. You stare back through the mirror of the water and are suddenly afraid to meet the bird's gaze any other way. It has claws for feet. You think to yourself, little skeletal claws. The doors of the keep suddenly swing open and Ulrant storms out. He glances at you for a moment but looks away as he speaks. You both can stay, he sneers, but mark my words, that child will be the death of you. A flash of memory once more, and Gorion walks out of the keep as he is today, dead. You drop your gaze back to the water so as not to see. The raven is gone, but your own image remains. Your eyes are black, like those of a bird. Like father, like child, the reflection says. You wake with a yell, predictably unrested. Though, real quick, I do want to mention, it is possible to miss this letter here in Candlekeep, and if you do, there is another opportunity to learn it during Chapter 7, which is the next chapter. But for now, let's get back to it. While we're wandering the actual keep itself, there is a very good chance we will eventually run into a guy named Kovaros, who tells us he has something that used to belong to Garion he would like to give us, and then he'll go on to describe in weird detail the circumstances of Garion's death, which would make you obviously not trust the guy, so feel free to deny the ring. But even if you accept it, it doesn't really matter. In addition to this, we can find Realtar and his business associates having their meeting, and you can actually choose to kill them or let them be, basically. However, shortly after this, specifically the meeting with Kovaros, you don't actually have to talk to Realtar. Once you make it to the top of the tower, or you choose to leave the building, you will be arrested by the Wardens of Candlekeep for the murders of Realtar and his associates. Now, you're thrown in prison pretty promptly, and then the leader of Candlekeep, Ulrant, comes by to explain that this is an awful way to honor your father's legacy, how dare you do this kind of stuff. Well, right after he leaves, another mage named Teltharil comes in and explains that as a favor to Gorion, he's going to free you from this. And you can ask him about what happened to this Kovaros guy, because especially if you didn't actually murder Realtar, you might have some questions, because even if you don't murder them, you will still be thrown in prison. Teltharil will say he has no idea who... Kovaros is. He did want to mention that Kovaros is Saravok, spelled backwards, and Saravok was here 
with Realtar when they first arrived. Real quick though, I do want to mention that that doesn't make a lot of sense because we got that letter back in chapter five that said Saravok wasn't coming to Candlekeep for this meeting, which would explain the whole Kovaros part. But then you have this line where he's like, oh yeah, Saravok was here. And that just doesn't make any sense, but not the point. Teltaro will give you a means of escape by teleporting you to an unused part of Candlekeep that leads to the catacombs. Now we have to escape the catacombs. Now this is actually super easy to do once you know the path through the catacombs, but there's a lot down here so feel free to explore should you happen to play this game yourself. There's a lot of cool stuff you can find in here. But the first floor is literally the exits like directly to your right as you walk in. And the second floor is pretty much just a straight path through actually. However, you will be accosted by several of your childhood friends, if you will, that are actually doppelgangers that attack you on site after they talk to you and mess with your head a little bit. You can actually run into Elminster and Garion, who upon talking to them, it becomes very clear that they themselves are doppelgangers who attack you. So clearly they're trying to make you think you're crazy at the very least, but eventually you'll get out of the catacombs and into an actual cave system. In the cave system, we will run into a man named Pratt, who is specifically here to wait on Saravok, according to him. However, he recognizes you and attacks you on sight, so you have to then fight him and his friends. Once he dies, he drops a letter that is very revealing about what is happening here. Because remember, Realtar was a leader of the Iron Throne, and now he's dead. We know that it was probably Saravok, because we were told that Kovaros is Saravok spelled backwards, and Kovaros is not dead. So this letter on Pratt explains that basically Saravok left Pratt down here because he was originally intending on meeting him here. However, things worked out better once you showed up because he could pin the murders on you. So basically, if you didn't actually kill Realtar yourself, Saravok has doppelgangers dress up like you and murder his father, and then pins that murder on you. Moreover, this letter explains that basically, Saravok is going to head back to Baldur's Gate to claim Realtar's position over the Iron Throne, and then leverage that position on the Iron Throne to become a Grand Duke of Baldur's Gate. All terrible stuff, all things we would like to stop, we can finally head out of the actual cave system here where we will meet one last person who is not killable but works for Saravok. This guy will do a slight bit of plot filling in if you didn't talk or get the letters from the appropriate people. But basically this guy's whole purpose is to fill in some holes in case you skipped them. But we didn't so we pretty much know everything he has to say already. And once we escape the catacombs of this cave system here, we find ourselves just outside of Candlekeep which is the beginning of chapter 7, the last chapter of the main game where we need to return to Baldur's Gate. That, however, is where we are going to leave part 3. All in all here, we discovered that while Realtar's plan might have been to use this iron shortage to enrich the Iron Throne, Saravok betrayed him, clearly had him murdered, had that murder pinned on you, and is now trying to use his father's position to gain a potential Grand Duke position with the city of Baldur's Gate. Now, in addition to all the many times he's tried to kill us, that's a pretty good reason to try to stop him. Plus the fact that he is clearly aware of who you are as a ball spawn that we don't know much about Saravok himself at this moment. That's going to do it for today, guys. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you part 4 of our Story of Baldur's Gate series. In part 3, we discovered exactly what Saravok's plans were for Baldur's Gate, or at least that he intends to ascend to the title of Grand Duke, after having you framed for murder. So with that out of the way, let's jump right into this here. First things first, as we start this act and you head back to the city of Baldur's Gate, which is our primary objective here, remember, you are wanted for murder, which means the Flaming Fist very much so want to imprison you. Now, it is possible to fight and kill the Flaming Fist guys here. However, doing so will typically cause you a huge hit to your reputation, which is a problem for some classes more than others, but in general, it's a bad idea. Now, as you're walking around Baldur's Gate, you might get stopped and caught by the Flaming Fist, or at least the first time you run into them, at which point you'll be given a mock trial by Angelo, who has apparently taken over since Scar has been murdered, which we'll talk more about here in a minute. Now, Angelo, typically speaking, sentences you to prison. Now, it is possible to have a companion in your party named Chartil, who is actually Angelo's daughter, and he will set you free if she's with you. 
But if not, we have to escape the prison by either attacking or solving a riddle from a guy in prison as well named Neb. Now, after we escape this, it's important to note that for the most part after this, all of the Flaming Fist will just be hostile. They won't try to arrest you again. They'll just try to kill you. So it's usually better to just walk away from them. But with that out of the way, let's actually talk about some other stuff. The first place I usually like to start with this is the eastern portion of the city where the Sorceress Sundry's shop is. Now this is typically because you can get all of the quest leads started pretty much right in that one section. However, I do want to mention that Chapter 7 has a lot of variations. There's only a couple things you really need to do, but there's a lot of variations on it that can kind of change little things here and there. So keep in mind, the order in which I'm going to tell you these things isn't necessarily the order it would actually happen for you, if some of it even happens at all. But in this area, we can run into a few people. First and foremost, we can run into Tomoko. She is usually right in front of Sorceress Sundries, and she will explain a few things, but most importantly, she'll tell us that Duke Elton, who actually sent us to Candlekeep earlier in the first place, has since fallen mysteriously ill and his healer is probably the one responsible for it, and she urges you to check that out at the Flaming Fist headquarters, where she says she will meet you out front. Also in this area, we can run into Delthier. Delthier is a member of the Harp, and he will explain that most people at this point think that you and your party have been working for the nation of Om this entire time, because everyone thinks war with Om is imminent, that Om is gearing up for war. He tells us that Scar was assassinated, and it would seem the Shadow Thieves, who reside in Alm, are apparently to blame, though the circumstances are incredibly suspicious as well. Now, from here, if we head back to the Flaming Fist headquarters, we can meet Tomoko out front, who will give us a bunch of information. She will ask you to defeat Saravok, but not to kill him, because she was apparently Saravok's lover at one point. Moreover, she'll tell us a bit of a bombshell of information, and that is that Saravok is actually our half-brother because he himself is Bald Spawn as well. And that Saravok isn't just trying to take over the Iron Throne and ascend to the title of Grand Duke. He's actually trying to start a war with Om altogether, which we'll talk a little bit more about here shortly. And then lastly, Tomoko will ask us to kill Scythandria, which is apparently another of Saravok's lovers and... Tomoko wants her dead because apparently Scythandria is very much so trying to get Saravok to ascend to whatever he is, whereas Tomoko wants him to stay human, and moreover with her. Basically wants him to not die. But she will also tell us that Scythandria is at the Iron Throne headquarters as well. There's also numerous places we can learn that information, as every other time you turn around someone's like Iron Throne headquarters in this chapter. Now, since we are right in front of the Flaming Fist headquarters, now is as good a time as any to check on Duke Elton. So once we walk in, we'll immediately be set upon by basically all the Flaming Fist. For the most part, the Flaming Fist in this building should be okay to kill without taking a hit to your reputation, but you might want to keep an eye on it. And we need to get upstairs to talk to Duke Elton, where he was and where we spoke to him previously. Now, we'll actually run into his healer, Rashad, who, upon the slightest bit of questioning, turns into a doppelganger and tries to kill us. At this point, Elton will ask us for his... Elton will ask us for our assistance in getting him to the Harbor Master, which is a trusted friend where Duke Elton can recover. And I suggest we do just that. We can take Duke Elton to the Harbor Master, which is in the same district as the Iron Throne, which is a great place to go check out that tower. Now, we get a ton of information from a bunch of NPCs that stop and talk to us on every floor, very similarly to the last time we were here. They will tell us that Saravok has basically tossed the Iron Throne aside now that he plans on becoming Grand Duke and has effectively taken over the Flaming Fist. He's basically done with the Iron Throne and has bled them dry. We also learn that Saravok will be named the Grand Duke soon and is actively encouraging a war with Om. This is important because we also garner from these conversations that just accusing Saravok at this point isn't enough. We need to actually find proof of what Saravok is trying to do here, and that is that he's trying to start this war with Om. So we need to gather proof and then head to the Ducal Palace, basically, where the inauguration for Saravok is taking place. Now, at the very top of the Iron Throne Tower, we will run into Sithandria, actually, and once she is dead... She will have letters on her confirming that Saravok actually hired assassins to kill one of the Grand Dukes as well as start to target the other two, thus giving him complete control over Baldur's Gate, if it were successful. 
We can also pick up Sarah Vox's diary, which will explain much of what we already know at this point, that he's ball spawn, that we're ball spawn, that he's doing all these nefarious deeds. But we want to keep the diary on us, if nothing else. Now, Sathandria, as well as Tomoko earlier, will actually also point us to a place called the Undercellar, where apparently the assassins that were sent to kill one of the dukes are actually being holed up at. Now, this is pretty straightforward. We just go to the Undercellar. There's a short conversation. We kill them. We pick up the letters from their body, which provide us proof that Saravak hired assassins to kill some of the Grand Dukes. Moreover, they also have an invitation to the Ducal Palace for the inauguration of Saravak as well. Now, in addition to this, it is also possible to make contact with the Shadow Thieves here as well, the ones that were framed for Scar's murder, and they can potentially help you out here shortly to come as well. But there is a little quest there as well. It's not wholly necessary for the chapter, though. But at this point, we should have several forms of proof of Saravok's deeds, as well as an invitation to the Ducal Palace, which is in the northernmost section of Baldur's Gate. Once we get there, we will have to present our invitations to the doorman, who will then allow us in. Now at this point, once we walk into the inauguration room, there's a lot of people talking, and two of the Grand Dukes that are still alive are in the process of raising Saravok to the title of Grand Duke. Saravok announces his war against Om as well as taking over the Flaming Fist. However, he then shortly thereafter attempts to have both of the Grand Dukes in the room assassinated because a lot of the noble people here are actually doppelgangers in disguise. This is actually a pretty important part of the story because if these doppelgangers succeed in killing the two Grand Dukes, it's game over. If you save the Dukes but then don't have any evidence of what Saravok has actually done, i.e. his diary or his letters to the assassins, then you will be sentenced to death right here and die. So once you get to this point in the story, it's important that we both have the proof of what Saravok has done, as well as save the Grand Dukes in this fight. Once Saravok's plan falls apart right in front of him, he attacks you, but one of his mage friends pops in and teleports him elsewhere. The Grand Dukes use a spell of sorts to track his movements, and they tell you that he was actually teleported to the Thieves' Guild nearby. We'll be teleported to follow Saravok, actually, at which point we'll find ourselves in the Thieves' Guild, and the Thieves therein will actually point us in the direction that Saravok went. Now, this requires us to go through a maze just below the Thieves' Guild. The maze itself is pretty straightforward, it's pretty linear, and because of the camera angle, Mazes aren't exactly the most difficult thing to figure out here. The maze itself is filled with uh, quite a few tough enemies, especially on higher difficulties and a bunch of traps as well. Moreover, at the end of the maze, right before we get to where we need to go, we'll run into a man named Winsky. Winsky is important because he tells us exactly what it is Saravok is trying to do here. Saravok isn't just starting a war with Om just to start one. Saravok is doing this because he hopes to basically cause death on such a mass scale that it awakens his child of Baal blood, thus allowing Saravok to potentially ascend to godhood that way. That's what Saravok is actually trying to do. And it would appear this Winsky fellow was a mentor to Saravok and helped him learn a lot of the magic rituals and things that Saravok has needed along the way. Now, once we walk through this door, we'll find ourselves very close to the end of the game. So potentially you're supposed to be able to uh, sleep right here and get one last dream. I couldn't get it to actually show up, so sorry about that. But just know there is actually one more dream that's supposed to take place in Chapter 7 here. Now as we walk up the road a little bit, we will run into Iron Throne bounty hunters who are here to collect on Saravok's head for what he did to the Iron Throne. But they turn on you quickly as well because the Iron Throne also still hates you despite you know everything you did because of Saravok. A little farther up the road still, we will run into Tomoko yet again. Now, this can go one of two ways. She will have to fight you because Saravok has learned of her treachery and won't have anything to do with her otherwise. But it is possible to talk your way out of this situation if you killed Scythandria for her, as well as have a high enough, I believe, charisma to pass the uh, invisible speech checks, if you will. Technically, it's called like an NPC reaction, but you get the gist. It's possible to talk your way out of this fight with Tomoko if circumstances are met, or you'll be forced to kill her. And then we can enter the big temple, the Temple of Baal. This is where we will confront Saravok. Now this can be a tough fight for a variety of reasons. On every difficulty, there's a way to get through it. And chances are, if you've gotten to Saravok, you'll probably be fine getting through him. 
Now, once he goes down, that's the end of this chapter, as well as the main campaign for the game. We are then treated to a cinematic where we are shown Saravok's essence leaving his body and then returning to a statuette, apparently, somewhere. And then it pans out to reveal that there are hundreds, potentially even thousands, of these statues that would imply all of them are ball spawn. Which I think is meant to give you the idea that this is what happened just between the two of you. Can you imagine all the chaos being bred by the spawn of ball? But that's going to do it for today and part four, guys. So there you are. There is part four of our Story of Baldur's Gate series, which is technically the ending of the main game. But I'm going to have one more video covering Siege of Dragonspear, since that is technically officially part of the game as well. So with those things out of the way, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. ago, the malevolent Saravak brought the city of Baldur's Gate to the edge of destruction. You, like him, are a child of Baal, the dead god of murder. Baal foresaw his own death and sired mortal children in an effort to bring about his return. Saravak intended to become the new lord of murder. You put an end to Saravak's plans and slew your half-brother. With his passing, you became known as the hero of Baldur's Gate. Now, a new threat casts a shadow over the city. A massive army on a holy crusade has thrown the Sword Coast into turmoil. Little is known of the crusade's leader, the charismatic warrior Kalar Argent. Those who follow her revere her as the Shining Lady, but her background and goals are shrouded in mystery. Some say she is divine, a hero sent by the gods to crush evil no matter the cost. Others whisper that she is another spawn of Baal, intent on following the same path as Saravok. One thing above all else is clear. If the Sword Coast is to find any measure of peace, Kalar Argent must be stopped. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you our final part in our Stories of Baldur's Gate series. In this particular part, we are covering the Siege of Dragonspear, specifically the main plot of Siege of Dragonspear. There's actually a ton of side quests and variations and things you can do here and there. So we're going to cover some of that, but mostly the main plot here, so people actually know what it's all about. As Siege of Dragonspear is intended to bridge the gaps between the first and second games. Now, it is worth mentioning real quick, though, that Siege of Dragonspear was put out in 2016, whereas the original game released in 1998. So, Siege of Dragonspear was made just for the purpose of kind of filling in the gap between the two games. So, with that out of the way, as we learned from the intro cinematic there, after Saravok is defeated, everything is mostly fine except Kalar Argent and her crusade to the north, which has a lot of questions involved in it. Outside of those things, we start the game tracking down one of Saravok's final lieutenants, specifically a woman named Korlaz, or Korlaz, however you want to do it. But this woman worked for Saravok. 
Now, we start out by talking with Emowyn, who is with us here, and if we ask her some questions during this conversation, she will explain that she is being taught how to be a mage from Duke Janeth, and as such, isn't available as a party member, but we'll explain that if we need any help, there's Flaming Fist here to help as we clear this tomb and search for Corlaz. So as we move forward, we'll quickly run into one of her people, at which point they will explain that what Saravok's people here are doing in general is trying to get a hold of Saravok's sword, or at least they already did, and they sold it to someone. And they thought that you might be here to get that sword back. However, it's already gone. But as we make our way through the catacombs area, which is the second level of this dungeon, we will eventually make our way to Korlaz and where she is hiding. Now, this is a fight, obviously. You can choose to spare the people down here if you wish, or you can kill them outright. Right now, that's not a big deal. It does have some implications later throughout the actual story, but we'll talk about that at the appropriate time. Now, after this initial little introductory mission, once we leave, we'll be hit with this little narrative. She's defeated, and the last of Saravok's influence died with her. Your foster father, Gorion, has been avenged. With the exception of your friend Imowen, those who helped you thwart your half-brother's schemes drift away from you, returning to their lives. For the first time since you left Candlekeep, you have the opportunity to reflect on the astonishing turns your life has taken. Though you are fettered by the rulers of Baldur's Gate, a sense of unease plagues you. You can't help but hear the rumors, the whispers that you share the same dark blood as Saravok. Some hint you killed your half-brother, not for the good of the city, but so you could usurp his place and his power. For the moment, however, your persecutors' voices are drowned out by an ever-growing number of others with more immediate concerns. Every day, more refugees driven from their homes by the servants of Kalar Argent arrive at the city gates. Many have stories of the Shining Lady's grace, all have tales of her followers' wrath. A ten day after Corlage's defeat, you retire to your chamber in the Ducal Palace, your thoughts troubled. You wonder what effect Kalar's crusade will have on Baldur's Gate, little knowing how close at hand the answer is. Now, in that narrative, we of course learned that our companions outside of Imowen have dispersed back to their regular lives, and moreover, that Baldur's Gate is being flooded with refugees from Kalar's Crusade to the north. Now, after this, we are woken up by Imowen, who's been hearing strange sounds around the Ducal Palace. Shortly after this, we are attacked by assassins, who manage to hit Imowen. Now, Duke Janeth, who is training Imowen, shows up to help Imowen out and make sure she lives. Your job is to clear the rest of the Ducal Palace, which involves just killing a few more assassins. And then you can go downstairs to talk to all four of the Dukes of Baldur's Gate. Now, they will task you with gathering your companions that are still in the city, if, if you should so choose. Moreover, you can also explore and prepare for an expedition, because the Grand Dukes are tasking you to go and accompany some Flaming Fist troops to the north to head off Kalar's Crusade. Which, even if you don't agree to, you have to do, because that's the game. But moreover, she did send assassins to seemingly try to kill you, so you might have an interest in doing so. As you get ready to go on the crusade here, or your own personal crusade against Kalar's crusade, you will have the opportunity to explore Baldur's Gate a little bit. Now, mostly this is just small side quests in hub areas around the city, such as Sorceress Sundries and Elf Song Tavern, the Flaming Fist headquarters, that type of thing. You don't have to do this at all, you can completely skip it. Even if you don't get all the companions that are available to be rounded up right here, they just show up in camp in the next act. The only thing that's really missable here is a specific item you can get at Elf Song Tavern, which will be used for an achievement, which we're not really going to cover here, but my point is you can miss that. But beyond that, there's not really much you can miss by just not exploring this besides some side quests. So whenever you're ready, tell Corwin, the woman who's been talking to us here and there, who is one of the new companions for Siege of Dragonspear, that we are ready to head out, basically, and... At any point after this, we can then head upstairs to the Ducal Palace and attempt to sleep. Now, when we arrive in that room, we'll be greeted by a hooded man. Now, this hooded man will make a bunch of cryptic remarks, basically, about watching the situation unfold, but we learn very little from this conversation outside of the introduction of the character. Now, we can speak to Emowyn in our room here as well real quick, and she will explain that she's not coming as she is recovering from her poison wound from the assassins. Moreover, she's still studying under Duke Janeth anyway, 
and she wouldn't be much use to you in the field. So at this point, we can actually go to sleep, and then sometime in the morning, we are woken up by a young woman named Ski. Ski is one of the Duke's daughters, uh, Intar Silvershield. Now, Ski will basically tell you that she is joining the Flaming Fist so she can accompany you guys north because she is bored of being trapped in her noble life as she sees it, and asks you not to tell her father. Now, when you go to leave, you'll talk to the Dukes downstairs one more time. You can choose to tell Intar that his daughter is joining the Flaming Fists. He will tell you that he already knows this, but thanks for the information, and you get a reward if you tell him. And at this point, you can leave the city after you go outside and talk to Corwin again. As you're leaving, some people in the crowd, mostly cheering for you, but some people will accuse you of being in league with Saravok, as it is slowly becoming more and more known that you are his half-brother. But once we leave the city, that brings us to the next act of the game, where we arrive at the Flaming Fist camp. Captain Shale Corwin and her aide, Corporal Bence Duncan, maintain order in the caravan from Baldur's Gate. Some who joined the expedition are unaccustomed to Flaming Fist discipline. Hard lessons are learned in the early days of the march north. The journey is slowed by the Crusade's victims. A multitude of broken, haunted men and women clog the coast way. When asked, they speak of fields set aflame, granaries ransacked, and family conscripted by the crusade. Yet many characterize these hardships as necessary sacrifices in pursuit of a greater good. A strange acceptance, even admiration of Kalar Argent is disconcertingly common in those she has wronged. Some proclaim the Shining Lady a prophet, doing the work of not one but all faiths, all gods. Is it possible Kalar Arjun's cause is a righteous one? Or is she engaged in a great deception to further her own agenda, as Saravak once did? And what of your goals? Many souls were lost during the Dragon Spear Wars. I will see justice done and restore them to the light. Yes, quite honorable. But what makes you think yourself capable of achieving this, Kayla Argent? You dare befoul my person with your magics? Blood is something to behold, not fear. Your divine heritage radiates from you. From which of your parents, mother or father? Enough of these games, and enough of your questions! Heffernan, get this mage out of my sight! At once, my lady. We will have words about this, Scarred One. Perhaps. The camp here will act as our actual camp. All of our companions, if dismissed, will go here. We can find vendors and everything that we need. The Siege of Dragonspear expansion is very linear, so every time we leave an act, we can't go back to the previous areas. So while the acts themselves can be completed relatively quickly, all the side content there has to be done while you're doing that act because you cannot come back to them afterwards. So in this first area here, all we actually have to do is go and find the bridge to the northeast of us. The Flaming Fist and basically everyone else in your war party, if you will, are going to spend the night here and then in the morning take this bridge farther on to Dragonspear Castle, ideally, which is where the Crusade is actually holed up, which is something we can learn before we leave Baldur's Gate from the Dukes themselves who tell us basically where we're headed specifically when we go north. The Flaming Fists are going to camp here and then continue on in the morning. However, you can choose to poke around, which obviously you have to do. So the actual goal of this is to just find this bridge to the northeast of us. And as soon as you show up, there's a bunch of Crusade forces guarding it. They panic, a mage blows up the bridge and we are forced into a fight. After this fight, none other than Kalar Argent actually shows up. Because of the space in between the bridge and everything, and she's on the other side of it, she requests a parlay with the Child of Baal. Now, you can learn quite a few things from this conversation. For starters, while she is initially blamed for sending the assassins after you that we mentioned earlier, according to her, she wanted you captured, not killed. Moreover, she goes on to explain that she is not a Baal spawn, as, as has been alluded to here and there. She is actually an Asimar, which is a person of divine heritage from like a solar or a celestial entity, usually, that can sometimes manifest in mortals. 
which makes them an ASMR. Now, Kalar will explain, if you choose to ask her about it, that her goal is to march into the first layer of hell, Avernus, and bring back lost souls. The specifics of this are not known to us at the time, but she will tell us as much. Now, after this conversation and the bridge being destroyed, that's it for this chapter. That's all we have to do, and whenever we're ready, we can go to the world map and choose to travel to the Troll Claw Woods, which begins the next act of the game here. With the coastway crossing destroyed, the only safe route across the winding water is Boriskir Bridge, where your father Baal was murdered by the mad god Siric. Each step toward the distant landmark fills you with unease. You are not alone in that. The flaming fists also fear what may lie ahead. If Kalar has destroyed Boriskir Bridge, the expedition will not reach Dragonspear Castle in time to stop the crusade. The forces of Baldur's Gate and its allies will be outmatched, slaughtered. These fears grip your allies, but also drive them forward. The anxious whispers fall silent when the march is called to a halt less than a day's travel from Borskir. The flaming fist sets up camp and prepares for the next meeting with the crusade, while you plan your next move. I am sorry for your loss. But rest assured that your husband's sacrifice will never be forgotten. Signed, yours ever in faith, Kalar Argent. I am sure the family will find your words most comforting, milady. More letters of condolence, my lady? Surely there are other more urgent matters that require your attention? I am not of a mind to argue this again, Heffernan. Their deaths lay heavy on us all, my lady. But they sacrifice themselves for a greater good. Letting their passing distract us would do them a disservice. Condolences can wait. You are correct. We cannot afford distractions at this juncture. Gather the faithful. We have much to do. Now, this act is also deceptively simple. But basically what it boils down to is that because the bridge we were originally planning to use to march to Dragonspear Castle, got destroyed, we have to find a second one known as Boriskir Bridge. Now, this particular act has a lot of variation in the way things can go down. So when we first arrive at our new Flaming Fist camp, the Corporal of the Flaming Fist, the uh, Vince Duncan, will explain the situation where basically there's a standoff between the Crusade and the Keep of Bridge Fort, which is currently under siege right outside the bridge of Boriskir Bridge. What we need to do in this act is resolve the stalemate between the Crusaders and the people inside Bridgefort, which is under siege. Now, we have a ton of options available to do this with, actually. We can just attack the Crusaders outside of Bridgefort just directly, which would be very, very difficult on higher difficulties. You can do it on, like, story mode or, if you're just really careful, higher difficulties. But there is a ton of people in that Crusader camp, so it can be very difficult, and you might not want to do that. Alternatively... There are a couple of ways inside the Crusader camp, non hostily as well as the Keep of Bridge Fort, even though it is under siege. We can talk to Jahira, actually, one of the recurring characters from the first game that we can run into on our way to the Crusade camp, who will inform us that there's a way inside Bridge Fort, but we require a wardstone to activate a teleport circle that leads inside. This wardstone should be at the ruined temple of Baal, which has now been taken over by worshippers of Siric, the god who killed Baal. So, if we choose to go to this temple of Baal, which is hidden inside a couple caves, where we can fight a dragon, by the way, the first one in the game, but through this cave system will lead us to the temple of Baal. This temple has been taken over by followers of Siric, who are all hearing voices and things and going generally insane, which might not sound interesting at first, because Siric is the mad god. It does get a bit more interesting than that. First of all, Right when we enter, we can find a trapped crusader. If we choose to free him or kill him and take his seal off of him, we can report this news to the crusader camp, which will then allow us entry because a relative of this trapped crusader is in the crusader camp and we can kind of gain entry that way by saving or just bringing the news of what happened to him to his relative. However, should we continue to explore the Temple of Baal, we can find some interesting things. For starters, we can kill a dragonkin who has the key we need to get farther into the temple, which is pretty cool. Apparently, she's of some relation to the dragon guarding the cave, by the way. That's what the dialogue tells us. But once we have her key, we can descend deeper into the temple here. 
where we can run into a Neolithid as well as a few other enemies, but we can actually happen across the leader of Cyrix followers here, who will actually have the Wardstone on her person that we need to activate the teleport circle to get into Bridgefort. She is under the impression that something is driving her followers insane that is absolutely not the Mad God Cyrix. This has nothing to do with the main plot of Siege of Dragonspear. I only mention it because what is actually controlling the followers of Cyrix inside this temple turns out to be a Mind Flayer. And because of Baldur's Gate 3's focus on Mind Flayers and the fact that this was made in 2016, I kind of, just as a quick aside, am curious if they were trying to weave in a potential Mind Flayer plot because it's kind of an open secret that Beamdog, the people who made Siege of Dragonspear, originally wanted to make Baldur's Gate 3 before they got passed over for it. Again, none of that has anything to do with anything as far as the story goes. I just wanted to mention it. Once we have the Wardstone, that will get us access to Bridgefort, from the teleport circle, which opens up a few more options for us once we're inside that keep. Those options being rallying the people inside the keep to have them attack the crusaders from the keep, as well as enlisting the flaming fist from your camp to actually head up a double-pronged attack, which if you want to attack the crusaders is probably the way to go. You can also negotiate a peaceful surrender of the keep while destroying all the supplies inside so people live, the crusade doesn't benefit from it, and nobody dies, which is arguably the best option, really. And alternatively, I haven't mentioned it yet, but you can actually just straight up side with the Crusaders once you kind of save their uh, kids or whatever. You can actually sabotage the uh, door to the keep. Probably the worst way to go, I guess, if you really want to think about it. But basically, you can sabotage the uh, gate to the keep and help the Crusade get inside. So that's something you can do. A lot of variations with how this resolves. But the main thing is, this situation needs to resolve itself because you need to get across Boriskir Bridge. So using one of those many methods I've detailed, eventually the Crusade will no longer be directly in front of Boriskir Bridge, clearing the path for you to cross. Now, they try to blow up the bridge unsuccessfully this time because you managed to get to them first, and once you go to cross the bridge, you will be knocked unconscious by an unseen force, and this cinematic will play. Now, that was a depiction of Cyric killing Ball on Boriskir Bridge, because this is the spot where Ball died. At this point, we'll have another conversation with the Hooded Man, who will explain how despite having half a god in your veins, you seem to be unable to grasp your potential the way Kalar does, who has only a drop of divine blood from generations ago. But once that's done, we can leave, which brings us to the next act of the game. Signs of the Crusade's recent presence can be seen on the road to Dragonspear Castle, but the Shining Lady's actual servants are rarely encountered. The few Crusaders you spy in the distance invariably retreat at the first opportunity. As the march wears on, fatigue grips your company, tempers flare within the caravan. Your reputation as the hero of Baldur's Gate protects you from petty squabbles and angry outbursts. Or perhaps, after what happened on Boriskir Bridge, there is another reason few are willing to cross you. These thoughts are put aside when you see the banners of Waterdeep, Daggerford, and the Flaming Fist at the edge of the Coalition siege camp. Dragonspear Castle is near, and so is Kalar's Day of Reckoning. Why does he still refuse me? How can he deny the righteousness of our cause? We speak of a child of Baal. And yet the Baal spawn is the hero of Baldur's Gate, and by all accounts saved the Sword Coast from ruin during the Iron Crisis. You cannot ask me to show mercy to this abomination. Not after what happened to my brother. For the good of the Crusade, you must. We cannot take the Ballspawn's life. 
Forgive me, my lady. I do not know if I can do that. You can. I have faith in you, Ashatiel. For us, forgiveness must prevail over revenge. We are basically right outside Dragonspear Castle now, which is where the Crusade and Kalar Argent are held up. Once we arrive at our coalition camp, which is made up of all of the forces that were actually sent up here before us, as we are basically just reinforcements to the forces that were already here, we can talk to the leaders of this coalition, who will basically say that after the events on Boriskir Bridge, where the symbol of Ball was burned under you after you had your cinematic about how Ball was killed, that basically people don't trust you and they need you to leave camp, so the soldiers don't get too uneasy. However, they do have some work for you to do. They believe they know a back way into the basement of Dragonspear Castle, where hopefully you can learn some information, as well as soften up the Crusaders before any confrontation might happen. So that's our next goal. We need to go to the Underground River, basically, is what it's called, which is guarded by another Crusader camp, which we can, again, stealth or kill everyone in to get into the Underground River. And once we are in here, we are almost to the basement, actually. Before we do that, there is a side quest here in the Underground River area where you can meet an undead dragon who guards a door, but with words only. You can actually just walk right by it. And inside the cave that it was guarding, or the ruins it was guarding, we can kill a bunch of necromancers and find Heffernan's ritual notes. Heffernan is the mage that has been tagging along with Kalar Argent up to this point that we'll have seen in some of these cinematics, or scripted events, whatever you want to call them. Now, these notes ritual how... Heffernan was planning on raising a bunch of undead minions, basically. Which, as you might imagine, the righteous Kalar Argent would likely not appreciate. So that's something you can learn down here. And beyond that, once we get into the basement of Dragonspear Castle, all we need to do is find the lift up into the actual, like, proper basement, as this is more like a cave under the basement. Which we can do by talking to two ogres, and we can basically just talk them into letting us up. There's a few different ways to do this around this room. But once they agree to give us a lift up, we are in the actual proper basement. Now, before leaving the coalition camp, we were likely asked to poison the food and water supplies here, as well as plant a barrel potentially under the gate to Dragonspear Castle that could blow it up in the event of a attack, which are things we can do. But the main thing we want to do is find Heffernan down here because his quarters are down here and we can find him talking to a seemingly dark entity through a portal of sorts. Now, this is a big deal because, again, obviously we might be noticing a pattern here with Heffernan being much darker than Kalar Argent claims to be, who claims that she just wants to rescue lost souls from Avernus. Well, from this conversation, we can glean that Heffernan plans on opening a portal to Avernus, and he needs divine blood to do that. Kalar's wasn't enough. She's who they tried to do it with first, but because her blood from divines is so old, from being generations back, it's just not strong enough to do the job. So they want you, which is why they weren't actually trying to kill you at the beginning of the game, but kidnap you, so they can use your blood to open the way to Avernus to then supposedly rescue all of these lost souls. However, as we get the impression from this conversation and him talking to an entity through this portal, as well as if we save the ghost dragon from before, the ghost in Heffernan's room here, will give us even more context that Heffernan is clearly working with someone else in addition to Kalar, it becomes clear that Heffernan might not be who he's trying to say that he is. After this meeting with Heffernan, uh, obviously things don't go well, so we need to escape. We need to go all the way back to the Coalition camp, which involves fighting through all the Crusaders we didn't kill on our way here, basically. And once we reach the Coalition camp, we are told that the leaders of the Coalition have went to parlay with Kalar at the Dead Man's Wood, which we can leave and then go have that conversation. Basically, Kalar in this parlay says that they will give up and surrender their entire crusade as well as just disperse if they hand over you, the child of Baal. Now, depending on what you have or haven't done at this point, this might not make any sense, but as I've already explained, Kalar wants your blood to open this portal to Avernus. Even some of the dialogue you can have here acts like your character doesn't know that, but you can also have the potential to know that, so this conversation can be a little weird. Now, regardless of what you say, and even if you agree to give yourself up, it won't happen, and Kalar will basically demand a battle. Now, we head back to the Coalition camp and are immediately attacked. We have to fend off several attacks from Crusaders, in which we actually leave extra forces. We can kind of direct which forces we want to help with which wave. 
Ultimately, we have to defend our coalition camp from Crusaders, and once that's done, we can leave and head for Dragonspear Castle proper, where a siege will play out. Steel and magic still clash in the distance, but you have thwarted Kalar's attack upon the siege camp. The time has come for the combined forces of Waterdeep, Daggerford, and Baldur's Gate to take the battle to the Shining Lady. The walls surrounding Dragonspear's ruins teem with Crusaders. Among them are Kalar's most trusted lieutenants, men and women of unparalleled skill, ready to sacrifice all for their leader. Defeating them and penetrating the castle will not be easy, but that is the task before you. The battle unfolds as you expected, my lady. Our forces fall back to the castle even now. The battle is not the war. Whatever blood we shed is worth it as long as the child of Baal bleeds as well. What is your command? We must hold Dragonspear or all is lost. And the Baal spawn? Bring the child of Baal to me. Our triumph depends on it. The siege here can have a ton of variation, depending on what you did or didn't do, what side quests you completed. Did you poison the food and water in the basement? Did you set the barrel to blow up the gate? Did you recruit extra allies through side quests? Did you kill extra allies the siege defenders, the crusaders, could have? Or did you let them live and did they make it here to help the crusaders? A lot of variations to this siege, but basically, there's a battle here, you'll win it. Eventually, you'll run into Ashatil, which is Kalar's right-hand soldier, basically, who I believe is meant to be a solar, but I can't really tell if she does have wings, though. She will challenge you to one-on-one -on -one combat. If you defeat her in this combat, the siege will just be over. If you don't agree to that, you actually have to fight all the enemies. But once that's done, and you are inevitably victorious, Kalar retreats into the castle, at which point you will have to follow her. And eventually you'll make your way down to the basement where you were originally when you confronted Heffernan. And you'll get to open some big magical doors that you passed by the first time you were here. Upon opening these doors and walking in, Kalar and Heffernan will be by themselves initially. And they'll basically explain that they're still planning on using your blood and they lured you down here because this is where the portal to Avernus is. So Heffernan was supposed to bind you in place with magic, however, he also captures Kalar, because this is where Heffernan reveals his dastardly plot, because he is actually a servant of the demon Belafet. And in addition to opening the portal to Avernus, he plans on letting fiends use it to invade Toril, which is like the equivalent of Earth in D&D. So this happens, you all get transported to Avernus, or at least you travel to Avernus, Avernus, the first pit of the Nine Hells assaults your senses. The stench of brimstone and curdled milk fills your nostrils, coating your tongue and throat in a nausea-inducing film. The bitter moans of the damned envelop you, pressing in from all sides, smothering. As your watering eyes grow accustomed to the dim lava light of the pit, you begin to feel the oppressive majesty of the blasted waste around you. In pursuing the Shining Lady, you have been brought to the darkest place imaginable, and the pursuit is not yet over. Crusader corpses litter the ground around you, but of Kalar herself, there is no sign. And then you have to fight a bunch of demons in Avernus. So you need to basically chase down Kalar, who is still trying to do her thing of rescuing lost souls, supposedly, from Avernus here. Because this is where she wanted to go, just not the circumstances with which she wanted to be here. Now, we'll fight a bunch of demons, run into some crusaders, we'll move to the next map where we find ourselves on a bridge. We cross this bridge until we catch up with Kalar, who enters the tower where Belafed is. However, the doors close behind us, and we are greeted by the demon Thrix. So depending on this conversation, we can't really kill Thrix, but we can choose to attack him and he'll spawn like waves of demons and stuff to fight us. There is the option of a riddle, where if we solve his riddle, he'll just let us go up because he doesn't like his master anyway. But eventually after that, we will find ourselves riding an elevator up. So after a few waves of enemies, we'll find ourselves at the top of said elevator where we can confront Belafet. Now, this is where we learn a lot of things. Turns out, Kalar Argent isn't quite the righteous crusader she tried to make herself out to be because the entire reason she wanted to save these souls from Avernus was actually just one person. Her uncle, On Argent. 
on quite a while back when Kalar was just a child, actually saved her from Avernus after she inadvertently summoned demons and things. On sacrificed himself to save her, and Kalar's basically dedicated her life to saving just him. Everything else was just a byproduct. She wasn't really all that interested in all the other souls here. Now, because of Heffernan's betrayal and his service to Belafet, Belafet will try to turn Kalar into a blackguard, which can happen. However, during this conversation, you can also convince her to fight by your side. Depending on which way it goes, you'll have to either fight Heffernan and Belafet, or Belafet and Kalar turned blackguard, because if that happens, Belafet kills Heffernan outright. Now, once you've won this fight, you will be able to free and talk to on Argent, and potentially Kalar Argent, where they will explain some more of this stuff. And basically that while Kalar had good intentions, clearly she did terrible things for something that wasn't really worth one man's life. After this, you'll escape back to the portal to Toril, where either on Argent or Kalar will stay behind to close the portal with the demon blood, that should be able to close it. The blood from Belafet's defeated body. Now, if Kalar turned into a black guard, On will stay behind to guard this portal, and if Kalar was saved and joined your party, she will stay behind and guard this portal as well, which is probably a fitting punishment for all the deaths she's caused. Now, at this point, we can return back to the Crusaders. Now, I do want to mention just real quick that Belafet is actually the last boss of Icewind Dale, which is set about 87 years before the events of Baldur's Gate 1, just as a fun aside, which is why Belafet is trapped here. But once we get back, we'll be celebrated as a hero, again, because we effectively ended Kalar's Crusade. And we can enjoy the celebrations and eventually go to sleep, where we are then awoken. Now, this is where I want to take a moment to mention that while we are traveling throughout Siege of Dragonspear, it was very possible that we would have encountered several dreams with the Hooded Man. Because the Hooded Man claims to know all about our ball spawn heritage and is watching us and evaluating us for some unknown reason. Now, throughout these dreams, he will basically try to get us to attack people we used to know. Saravok, Imowin, and eventually they turn into these monsters that attack us and we either are killed or are forced to kill them. Now, these dreams are important because after all this happens, we have one of these dreams. Except in this dream, it is Ski from all the way back at the very beginning that is Duke Intar Silvershield's daughter. And again, we're forced to fight this thing and eventually kill it. And then we wake up and it turns out it wasn't so much a dream as reality because Ski Silvershield is dead in front of us and we're standing over her as a bunch of people walk in and discover the murder. Naturally, it is assumed that we, of course, probably did this, because we're standing over her coated in blood. So at this point, there's a bunch of conversation. You can try to convince people that obviously you wouldn't do this. But at the end of the day, you have to be taken into custody and brought back to Baldur's Gate. You return to Baldur's Gate under circumstances much darker than anyone would have believed. What should have been a moment of crowning triumph is instead a nightmare beyond your understanding. Ski Silver Shield lies dead, seemingly at your hand. The Siege Force's clerics are unable to revive her. Her magically preserved body has been transported to Grand Duke Entar Silver Shield, who clings to the faint hope that his daughter might someday be resurrected. You share that hope. Without Ski, you may never know the truth of what happened that dark night. Once you thought yourself free of your father's taint. But as you journeyed to Dragonspear Castle, you realized this was not so. You are a child of Baal, Lord of Murder. A piece of him resides in you. Has it grown beyond your control? Was yours the hand that plunged the dagger into Ski Silvershield's breast? You do not know, and that fact haunts you. When you left Baldur's Gate, people cheered you as the city's hero. Now they look upon you and see something very different. Now, this is sort of the epilogue, and it can actually also go a couple of different ways. There's a bit of a trial where you'll be like asked if you did this or not, and you can either present evidence, not defend yourself at all, admit to the terrible things you've done that all occurred while the Siege of Dragonspear was happening. So if you did the good thing, didn't poison your enemies, and were just generally righteous about your approach to this, you can present that as evidence, at which point people will believe you. However, due to the situation, you'll still find yourself in a jail cell. Alternatively, you cannot defend yourself at all, just let people think you're guilty, and then you find yourself in that jail cell. 
Now, this is where it changes. If you've effectively proved that you probably didn't do this through your actions, the dukes of the city, because of your service to the city, will just basically lead you to the sewers and be like, listen, we understand you probably didn't do this, but because of the situation, we kind of just need you to leave. Now, the other version of this is that if you didn't try to defend yourself or people just weren't convinced, then you'll eventually be broken out by a thief and you'll have to make your way through the sewers yourself, which involves fighting a bunch of things until eventually you find yourself at the same exit that the dukes would have led you to. Prior to this, the hooded man actually visits us in our jail cell, where it is revealed through a cutscene that the hooded man is the one who actually killed Ski and stole her soul so she couldn't be resurrected, literally just to put you in this predicament. Cutting back to the cave exit where we leave the city of Baldur's Gate, a wanted man, so to speak. Emowyn will meet us right outside the cave, will join up with us, we will then go on to meet some of the party members that we were with, usually Jahira, Khalid, Dinahir, and Minsk, or Minsk, and then you guys will leave, and then shortly after we'll arrive at a secluded place in the woods where the ending of the Siege of Dragonspear happens. Now, this ending is the direct tie-in to Baldur's Gate 2. So, with that out of the way, we have covered the story of Baldur's Gate 1 in its entirety, as well as the Siege of Dragonspear. There you guys go. There is the story of Baldur's Gate 1. If you enjoyed it, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you guys so much for watching. I love putting series like this together and sharing all this video game knowledge with the world. So truly, just thank you so much. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Your eyes burn as a thin, acrid mist rises from the ground and envelops you. Your mind clouds. Shadowed figures strike and fade away. Your companion's cries echo in your skull, and the world around you fades to gray.